So we've covered some of the issues there, rising PSA, failed treatment. I think one of the questions that was thrown up by Duncan's talk is, when you don't know what to do, we should be doing a study. We're clinicians first and foremost. We've, we're highly educated doctors learning to ask questions about things we don't understand. And that seems a very neat introduction to Matt Sides, who's come along to talk to us. Matt Sides works at the Medical Research Council. He was originally a clinical trials manager, and now he's a senior statistician. I'd like to know what the ordinary statistician is. <laughs> but he's senior, and he's going to outline to us the benefits, the reasons we should all be looking at the patients that we look after, say, can we do it better? Is there a study which we can put the patient into? And even better, could we go to the MRC with a study that we'd like to design and have your support to do. So, Matt, please tell us about trials, and in particular, the issue of the raise, rising PSA. Will do. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. So, clinical trials, why they matter, was the, uh, was the title I was given. As I was looking at the agenda, I, I started to feel it's very defensive as a title, as if none of you actually care or are interested in clinical trials. <laughs> and that really made me anxious. And then I got more anxious, because I, I looked at the agenda and I realised that I'm on last, and the last thing anybody wants is a statistician between them and a free glass of wine. <laughs> try and keep it short as we can. Look, I broke it down into three sections, and, and if I'm running short, I will ask John to drop the final section. I wanted to first talk about assessing treatments, you know, clinical trials design, and perhaps this is preaching for the converted, this kind of stuff, some of the basics of clinical trial design, how they define evidence-based medicine. Then a shorter section talking about prioritisation and, and how we review clinical trials and the selection of trials and why they matter at your site. And then we'll talk about a little of the ongoing research that's going on. And I'll try and pick up on radicals from a different angle to, I think it sounds like everybody else has, has already covered it today. So look, when we're looking at research, as, as you, you all know, what we try and do is, is improve outcomes for patients. We try and do this safely, we try and do it reliably, we try and do it effectively. And we need evidence. And we need that evidence to convince our peers the people who are going to be uh, you know, also potentially giving these treatments. And we need to convince these days purchasers, people who hold the purse strings. And, and the gold standard for this is a randomized controlled trial. And we'll go over some of the basics of why that is. One of the things we should always bear in mind is that the new treatments aren't always better. No matter what the Daily Mail or other papers may tell you, the new isn't always better. And we have to bear this in mind. So what we're doing with evidence-based medicine is a series of planned experiments we're going to involve people who've got the disease in question and we're trying to find out whether a treatment works and, and how best to use it. And the important thing, of course, from an individual's uh, perspective is, is not to compromise their care. So let's sort of go back. We've got a, a new hypothetical intervention, a, a drug X, if you like. It doesn't have to be a drug. It could be a technique. It could be a surgical technique. It could be a way of giving radiotherapy. But I'll probably lapse into calling it drug X. Through an, and you know, we want to give it to a group of people and test how it works. Now, the simplest way to do this would just be give it to a whole group of people. And that would be an uncontrolled, single group trial, and it would be quite straightforward and, and simple to do. But how would we know that that drug X has actually worked for us? We don't really know what would have happened if they hadn't received the drug. You know, a number of things could have happened uh, during the progress of the patient. They could have got better. Um, that's, that's, so we kind of need a control group to tell us whether somebody actually got better or not, because outcomes for patients are, can be unpredictable. Perhaps in, in cancer things are slightly different, but if we're looking at, say, asthma studies, then you know, people will fluctuate in, in how well they do. So we need, you know, if something happens once you've taken a treatment, that doesn't mean it was caused. Correlation and causation are two different things. Just because somebody gets a bit better after taking a drug doesn't mean the drug caused it. There's sort of regression to the mean, people will fluctuate, and if you measure them, you know, you catch them on a bad day, the next time you look, they're more, you're more likely to catch them on a better day. There's a Hawthorne effect, just by measuring, uh, but just by observing, just by measuring something, you can affect the way there's, uh, the, the things that the patients interact, and you know, this is it's a particularly important yeah, issue that we should always think about. And there's a placebo effect that we'll come back to later on. So we need a control group, we need to have people who've got the drug and people who didn't get the drug. And that's what we get in any form of controlled study. People who are getting the drug, our research group, and people who aren't getting the drug. But who should our control group be? Well, again, the simplest way would be to use historical controls. You're going to go off and you're going to give your drug X to all the new people, and you can compare it to people who didn't get the drug in the past. But of course, there are a series of problems with that. 
not least of all, you're going to be collecting the data retrospectively for the control group, and you're not necessarily going to get everything that you want. The groups of patients may not be exactly the same, the, 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 the current people may not be exactly the same as the past people. You may have some imbalance on prognostic factors, although fancy matching may get you around some of that, uh, albeit with, with lessened credibility. There are other issues around care that may have changed. The background treatments may have moved on compared to your historical calls, controls, your, how supportive care is given. And the groups may not have been assessed in exactly the same way. Perhaps your, your methods of being able to, uh, to scan patients have changed, or you know, I'm just trying to think how things have changed in prostate cancer in the, the pre and post PSA era. You know? So you've got to make sure, you're going to struggle comparing like with like. So perhaps what we need to do is get concurrent controls, people who are getting the drug now against people who aren't getting the drug now. And I thought you know, the first proper controlled study in the literature that's out there is, is a very famous situation that I'm sure you know of James Lind and, and Scurvy. James Lind was a surgeon. And actually, I, I, the, the piece of trivia, if you walk away with nothing else from this lecture, remember this piece of trivia, because I thought it was fascinating. In the 18th century, more British sailors were killed by scurvy than by the French or Spanish Navy. I thought that was fascinating. <laughs> So there was a theory at the time that perhaps something acidic would stop the putrefaction that was associated with scurvy. And James Lynn, back in 1753, wrote his sort of seminal treatise on the scurvy. It was a first controlled study. He got 12 patients and he treated them concurrently. And so he tried six acidic things, including, as you probably all know, oranges. And, uh, and they saw a, a dramatic effect. And, and they were very quickly able to tell that, that uh, the, the, the citric, citrus fruit was, uh, was effective in, in this instance, yeah, for treating scurvy. Vitamin C, they didn't know it was called, of course, at the time, but vitamin C is the issue. Not only was this the first controlled trial, it was the first controlled trial to have drug supply problems when they ran out of oranges after five days. <laughs> but actually, one of the sailors had already recovered and, and the, the other had almost recovered. But actually, what he got here, it was a first controlled study, but he had an uncommonly large effect here. You know, nothing worked really for the others, but the, the oranges worked, worked to treat. You had a very large signal to noise ratio, if you like. It was very easy to pick it out. But that's, that's not always the case when we just have uh, concurrent controls. Because very often, I have no idea how Lynn chose which sailors to give to which of those treatments. I, I have no idea quite how they worked out. But you know, if we were to imagine a study, then a number of factors could affect treatment choice. And they could also simultaneously be affecting outcomes for patients. So different prognosis and who gets, who gets which treatment. So you can imagine we, if we come back to our hypothetical drug X, that, you know, if we allow doctors to give some patients X and some patients not X, they may all choose to give X to the sicker patients because they're the ones that deserve the chance of this new and hopeful drug. Or conversely, they may be worried about side effects and they, they don't give X to the sicker patients. They give it to the, the less sick patients. Either way, if this is happening systematically, we're going to get bias in our assessment of our drug here. How can we get a clear picture? So what we need really is to make sure that we've got comparable groups of our concurrent controls. Compare groups of subjects who really differ in no way except for the treatment that they're receiving. And so if the outcome differs between those treatment groups, we can assume the difference is actually between those treatments. And there's a very nice uh, the, the short quote there from Bradford Hill, who's one of the sort of godfathers of, of clinical trials. We can do this through randomization, or which you may be hearing more and more these days known as random allocation. The first really modern randomized control was run, trial was run by the Medical Research Council, who, who I now work for, back in 1948, although I wasn't around back then. And they were looking at TB. They set out to find entry criteria. They had young men aged between 50 and 30 who had acute, uh, progressive pulmonary tuberculosis. And uh, they only randomized 109 patients, but they randomized them across seven hospitals. And they were randomized to the current standard of care, which was, which was uh, bed rest, just bed rest. Or in addition to that, they would have streptomycin. And actually, they had a further nice thing here. They, they were looking at how well men did after six months, and they, they took scans of, uh, of their lungs. And actually, those were reviewed by blinded radiographers. So the radiographers scoring here didn't know what treatment people had been on. And actually, so after six months, they looked at the data. They had, they had 107 patients for whom they had data. And the data, again, were clear here, uh, a very clear signal. There was a greater, uh, a considerable number uh, of patients more had a considerable radiographic improvement, as they defined it, in the streptomycin group, and fewer deaths. So it was fairly incontrovertible evidence here that streptomycin was effective in this group of patients. So randomization is great. Uh, it assures that our allocation is unbiased. 
you know, it's not determined by any factors, including the patient or the doctors or, you know, and it tends generally to produce comparable groups. And we can, we can help this along by explicitly balancing on some prognostic factors. Although, and if we do that, as if by magic, it tends to provide balance on the things that we didn't explicitly balance for as well. And it's also the theoretical foundation for our, our sort of uh, hypothesis testing. So really what we're trying to get to with randomization is, is a concealment of allocation. The key point is that the person who's entering the patient and the patient themselves doesn't know what treatment they're going to get. They won't know in advance what the next treatment would be. And that's always possible. We can always do that these, these days. It, it's always possible. And central methods have the most credibility. You, you've got a patient you want to put in a study, you phone us up and we do it on a computer. You, you go through some kind of interactive voice response system. You, you go to a website. It's possible to do local methods. You are, you have a sealed envelope, for example, but they, they do lack credibility and they, they really need, do need to be used cautiously. I, I saw a, a study recently on the ethics committee that I sit on, and they really were just going to have a hat in the surgeon, uh, in the theatre, and the surgeon was going to draw something out of a hat. You know, that's fine, it may work, but it's not tamper proof, and it's about the credibility issue. So, the strengths of randomised controlled trials is you've got random allocation, our unbiased comparison there. We're going to have prospective data collection, which is great, because both of our groups of patients, those getting drug X and those not, have been tested in the same way and followed up in the same way. We've got this contemporaneous assessment, regardless of what treatment you're getting. They're going to have the same assessment methods, the same ways, seen at the same time, and your outcome measures will be defined in the same way. So we're really going to separate that signal from noise. And as I said earlier, new isn't always better, and actually, you know, we, you know, things are often, it's small effects that we're looking for these days. So randomized control trials are the only reliable, the best, the most reliable way to assess treatments, and, and some would argue it's the only reliable way. But we do need to make sure we're doing our trial right after randomization as, as well. But random allocation doesn't prevent bias in the subsequent execution of the trial. You know, patients' responses may in some way be affected by knowing what treatment they're on. We need to caution against it. So perhaps even clinicians will act differently. They may scan in different ways or provide different supportive cares. So we need to be as objective as we can in what we're trying to do this. Of course, this is very likely to be, if it happens at all, a subconscious bias. Nobody is saying this is deliberate. Far, far from it, I hope. But it's particularly likely this kind of subjective data. You know, do you report pain relief? How do you report a, a, you know, a rash? And, and I think that the good example is, is, is a patient who wakes up with a headache one morning, having had a bottle of wine the previous night, and, and they know they're on drug X in a study, so they think, well, I had half a bottle of wine, it's probably a hangover, but maybe it could be the drug, I should probably report it to my clinician. And, and so they go and talk to the clinician, they mention they've got a headache, and suddenly we've got an adverse event coming in, and it's reported, and it, it's logged forever. Whereas a guy who knows he wasn't on the research treatment, you know, he's only going to subscribe his headache to the, uh, to, to, to the alcohol, and so he probably doesn't tell the doctor and he doesn't get involved. And, and already, you know, subconsciously, there, you're starting to kind of bias the, uh, the, the, in favour of, you know, bias the, the, the safety profile of the drug. And so we need to watch out for this in, 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 in many ways. So we can do this in a couple of ways, and we, we need to look at sort of blinding and objectivity. And, and so we can blind using dummy approaches or placebos, you know, a sugar pill or um, some kind of dummy procedure. You know, it's nothing more than a research tool, really. It's an inert medication or, or procedure. And it's certainly not about withholding treatment from any way, uh, from anyone, which is sometimes here. It, it's just a tool to try and help us with, with getting objective measures. And uh, you know, we can make that study much more reliable by blinding as much as we can. So, very typically in a lot of studies we'll have open label studies where everyone knows who's getting what. And then a single blind study, typically it's a doctor who knows but the patient doesn't. And then in a double blind situation, neither the patient nor the doctor knows, but the statistician will know in time for the analyses. And, and hopefully you, know, you never end up in this situation, which if you can't read it says, there's more of a triple blind test, the guy on the right saying, the patients didn't know which ones are getting the real drug, the doctors didn't know, and I'm afraid that. <laughs> So what we want to try and do is use the maximum reasonable blindness that we can. And, you know, this isn't always possible, is it? You know, if you're comparing surgery and radiotherapy, nobody's going to give dummy radiotherapy or, or dummy <laughs> surgery, at least with very invasive procedures. And you know, sometimes you'll have well-known side effects that are going to prevent blinding. I think, is it Tarsiva that's associated with a rash? So you'd know whether people are getting Tarsiva or not, because they get the damn rash. So you, you need to you know, sort of emphasize objective outcome measures where you can in this sort of setting. 
particularly, it becomes more important whether blinding isn't feasible. In cancer, perhaps, you know, it, we, it lends itself to the most objective outcome measure of all, which is whether patients are alive or dead. Um, but we can also look at the disease progression free survival, and we sort of predefine this. You know, so objective outcome measures are perhaps easier to, to work with in cancer than in, you know, in some other situations. And of course, going back to the earlier flippant example, we do want to be careful how we solicit adverse events. So of course, you, you kind of are aware, I'm sure, of, of the different types of trial. And, and really, you know, I'm drawing out here the, the benefits of, of randomized controlled trials, of phase three studies, where one's really assessing those risks and benefits and getting the biggest, clearest, most unbiased picture that you can. But of course, there is a role for, for carefully controlled non-randomized studies, it, perhaps it leading up to, to randomized controlled trials. It's very interesting to see that the size of effect that you see in randomized controlled trials is much more modest usually than you'd see in, in sort of non-randomized studies. The results in phase three studies do to, tend to be uh, uh, much more modest and, and perhaps much more realistic, certainly much more realistic than you might see in, in non-randomized studies or, or uh, other case-controlled studies. And so anticoagulants for heart attacks is a nice example. In 18 non-randomized studies put together, they reckon there was a 54% reduction in the risk of death, whereas actually in three randomized controlled trials, that was still an improvement, but it was only 21% reduction. But I reiterate this point that it's modest steps, generally what we're looking for, with a few notable exceptions in the past, everything we do in clinical trials is a series of modest steps. And actually, you have so few drugs that sort of come to phase one, phase two testing, ever get marketing authorization. And in academic studies as well as industry studies, you know, very few or only a surprisingly small proportion of, of studies are considered positive and actually move things on. New isn't always better. So let's move on to the second point, just a shorter section talking about prioritization really. And so what I wanted to pick up here, just to sort of reiterate where we were, you know, why do we do trials? We're trying to evaluate risks and benefits of sort of new interventions, or comparing perhaps sometimes a couple of standard interventions. And actually we're trying to pick up efficacy data and safety data, patient reported data, cost data. We should think about when we should do trials. When are we trying to assess a drug? When's the right time to be doing this? And of course we want to take a drug into a randomized setting, or even to a phase two setting, when we've got enough data to, to indicate that a new treatment may have some benefits, and, and perhaps that it may be acceptably tolerable, tolerable but when there's still enough uncertainty about the, the, the potential benefits, and there's kind of a window of opportunity very often. You know, sometimes change occurs without good evidence, and I, I think, without wanting to pick out surgeons at all, I think it's easy, it's more difficult to, you know, I think changes do occur, simple changes in practice leading on, that are perhaps less, less randomized in surgical technique. You know, one nice example is, is the CRASH study, uh, which is in head injury, where for years everybody knew that you gave corticosteroids to, to patients who had a, 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 a traumatic head injury. And then a, a huge multinational study was done where they actually, in a randomized setting for patients, a very interesting ethical question because it's one where you have to randomize patients who are unconscious at the time and can't consent for themselves. Randomized have corticosteroids or not, and they found corticosteroids were actually harmful there. You know, but they sort of snuck in without ever being assessed before then. Now, of course, we've probably got uh, you know, opportunities in prostate cancer now to look at some of the, 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 sort of the, the focal therapies, the high foods and the cryotherapies. So how are trials prioritized? Well, there are a number of groups that do this. There's, for example, the, the National Cancer Research Institute has a series of clinical studies called the set clinical priorities, what we think we should look at in prostate cancer, for example. So funders will do this, like uh, you know, I sit on the review group for, for Cancer Research UK for, for the Clinical Trials Advisory and Awards Committee. And they'll fund the highest priority, best quality studies. They have to prioritise. There isn't the money to fund everything that could be done. We have to pick the trials that will deliver. And even to some degree or another, trials units like MOA will decide which studies we think we should get involved with or not. We have to prioritise. We can't do everything. We've got to make sure we're doing the right trials at the right time. Peer review is a very important part of this. As you're developing something, the questions you want to go ask will go, ask will go out to your peers. The people who effectively you'll either be asking to participate and help you answer the questions, or who'll be reviewing your paper, or you'll be looking to, to take on your results in a few years' time. And they'll ask, is the question important? You know, do we already know the answer? Sometimes we do. Or is this being asked by other groups elsewhere at the moment? Why should we be duplicating efforts? Duplicating efforts? Is the proposal asking the right questions? Is it doing it in the right time scale? Could it be asking more questions? You know, could we be trying to wrap more up while we're consenting patients, while we're doing this? Could we be doing more here? Simultaneously, is it streamlined as it could be? Are we trying to avoid too many extra tests? 
And you know, we'll also ask whether the research teams are qualified to be doing things. By the time it comes to you guys at sites, you study, you're asked to take on board, that you'll discuss amongst everybody involved, will it be prioritised nationally? Unless it's just a local study, then national studies that come to you will have been prioritised nationally. It's the questions that we think we want to answer, that the clinical community wants to answer. And most hospitals will usually be approached for national studies and given the chance to, to participate. And of course, so they'll have been approved, they'll have national approvals in place. And, and then there's a question of, of the hospital, should they participate in the, in the study or not? And I guess what happens then is a sort of balance of local needs and agendas against national priorities. And, and there's a number of challenges then about clinical trials, um, whether they'll succeed, that I just wanted to touch upon here. Well, one, of course, is the, the, the practices and the attitudes of, 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 of the clinicians, of the oncologists and the urologists here. And of course, what one needs in every centre is an enthusiastic principal investigator. But even they can be hindered by a lack of internal cooperation. If the colleagues don't quite agree, if they don't agree with the national opinion as to what was the, the right question, it can make it very difficult to start up or, or recruit to a study. There's an issue about, you know, kind of, well, it's a lot of effort to run a study. How will I be rewarded? You know, how do we recognise the research activities that go into to national studies? Uh, traditionally, people think of authorship being a way to do this, but actually, you know, that's commonly not possible. A lot of people take part in studies, an awful lot of people take part, and, you know, the, the, the journals won't let everybody be an author. That's not a great way to do these things. But the research assessment exercises will score people very heavily on what they're publishing. And there's a lot of pressure, I think, on, on, on clinicians to, to, to be authors on papers. And so, you know, for your own career, it's much easier to do a, a, a local uncontrolled study. We sort of just ran through the weaknesses of those. A local uncontrolled study on which you could be the first author, but which perhaps won't move everything, move on the clinical field very much, but will get you, get you a publication. As opposed to participate and be a, sort of a smaller part player in a national study which will answer questions, well, which you won't necessarily be a named author. And so, you know, it's that, there's a this sort of interesting ratio of glory per investigator, which I think we need to, so need to, to react to, and I, I don't know how we do this yet. And it's particularly important in international trials where these things are spread even more thinly. And of course, another issue is a lack of time for research, trying to balance clinical demands with research ideals, and I hear that a lot of clinicians really feel this way. So, Another challenge is in terms of the funding that's out there, both nationally and local funding, and the availability of research time, research staff to support clinical trials. And, you know, I believe that things have changed with the new comprehensive local research networks and, and activity-based funding, but I'm doubt if I can get my head around this so far. And it, it seems remarkably complex, and, and I don't know if a lot of centres are, are you know, not going for everything that they could be doing. Another challenge, I guess, is the attitudes of nurses and other research staff, perhaps the people that you do. We need to make sure that everybody is pulling in the same direction on, on trials. And I guess it's the responsibility of the principal investigator to make sure that everybody in the team feels involved. No matter how research peripheral they might feel that they are, everybody needs to, to be involved. Because patients, if they're being considered for a trial, I understand they'll talk to a number of people, everybody they come across, what do you think? And it's quite easy for people who aren't so engaged in the study to, to put in a word or two that might scupper recruitment in, in some way. We need to make sure that everybody feels involved and is, is doing everything to kind of help streamline that. Everybody needs to be research focused and we need to be aware of that, those communication issues. And then the final thing is the attitudes of individual patients. And you know, there is a limited understanding of, 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 of public understanding of clinical trials. And you know, I've maintained, and I'm sure you do too, that you've just been diagnosed with cancer. That's the last time we want to hear about you know, medical research methodology and clinical trials. You know, who's going to take that on board when you're, you're thinking about your own health? So we need to kind of be chipping away on, on public understanding and making sure the research isn't seen as special, but just a part of routine practice. It's not weird to be asked to participate in a trial. It's just what should happen anyway. So I just wanted to touch very briefly now on some, some ongoing research. And uh, I, I so went to clinicaltrials.gov, which is uh, the main, I guess uh, the, the, it doesn't have complete saturation, but it's the it's a biggest clinical trial register that, that's out there on, on, on the website. I'm just trying to get a sense of what activity there is in, in prostate cancer that's been registered. And there's just over 3,500 trials that have been listed on clinicaltrials.gov, phase three randomized controlled trials of which actually 290 include prostate cancer. That's about 8%, so I thought that probably isn't bad. That was higher than I feared it might be. And if we look at the ones that are active at the moment, actually it claims that there's 1,300 randomized controlled trials 
be recruiting somewhere in the world at the moment, and 107 of those are in prostate cancer. That's a lot of research being done. It wouldn't let me narrow down reliably to, uh, to how many of those are ongoing in the UK. But uh, and just because I, I like uh, Venn diagrams, <laughs> It's always worth looking at the, 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 the website, Jessica Hadji's index website. I, I love, just the her daily cartoons are fantastic. This is the, the portfolio of the, the National Cancer Research Institute Prostate Clinical Studies Group. I'm afraid this is from a year ago, so this is slightly out of date. Some trials which have opened don't appear, some trials that have, were open here, they don't. But what I try to, try to give you here is a sense of the breadth of research that's going on in the UK, of academic uh, of research. And so there's studies here that are assessing surgery, radiotherapy, brachytherapy, uh, chemotherapy, other systemic therapies, other local therapies, the timing of treatments. There's a real gamut of, of things being looked at here. And actually these require inputs from surgeons, from clinical and medical oncologists, from nurses, radiographers, other research staff. There's, there's a real broad spectrum of research and there's a broad spectrum of people that we need. I think it's important to really, sort of really iterate that, that the trials require involvement from, from sort of beyond their speciality. And so I pick out these are the trials that I think are explicitly have surgery as one of the arms. But actually, it's so marked out in orange here. But the trials that require surgical input are in blue. Surgeons are the gatekeepers for the studies. They can make or break recruitment to particular trials. You know, they can be putting the word out. They can be having referrals. And so the same goes, of course, for oncologists and for, for nurses. And, you know, the, the, it's more beyond the speciality of what's happening in research. I want to focus very briefly on, on radicals. I'll, I'll take the radiotherapy timing element rather than the hormone duration element of radicals. And I, 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 don't, I, I don't know whether this has been covered. Do stop me if this has been done. No, we'll wait for you to come back in the room. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so without wishing to, to, to repeat what Duncan said, we know that some men who have radical prostatectomy will go on to die from, from, from prostate cancer. This is, I think, a very interesting graph because in breast cancer, we, we know what to do. You, we, radi adjunct radiotherapy has been assessed. Radiotherapy after surgery has been assessed in, 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 in breast cancer. And in this, what you wouldn't be able to see is a forest plot on the right-hand side, a meta-analysis drawing together all the randomized controlled trials of radiotherapy after surgery for, for breast cancer, and there's tens of them there. In prostate cancer, there's three. You know, so prostate cancer really does seem to be sort of the poor man uh, there of, of research, I think. And all of those are looking at adjunct radiotherapy, early radiotherapy, early post-operative radiotherapy, against very late radiotherapy or observation, where men perhaps didn't get radiotherapy at all. And you know, so we know there that giving radiotherapy is better than not giving radiotherapy overall, but we know that radio, adjuvant radiotherapy will have side effects, and we want to balance these, these risks and benefits because we don't have a <coughs> balanced picture. We have data, but we don't know that we're comparing like we'd like. We don't have any controlled studies of that at the moment, and it's important that we do that. And we know actually that deferred radiotherapy, early deferred radiotherapy, may be as effective as, as adjuvant radiotherapy uh, from, from a couple of studies. So if we put this together, you know, the, I think deferred salvage radiotherapy is quite commonly used as an approach in the UK. But the, the, the only randomized data, the only data we have from randomized controlled trials says we should be giving radiotherapy adjuvantly after surgery. So should it be early or deferred radiotherapy? You know, and the question is sort of unanswered. You know, the published trials don't tell us this. Um, and you know, selective deferred radiotherapy will be cheaper and it should be less morbid. You're only giving it to people who actually need it, whose PSA starts to rise. But early radiotherapy might be more effective overall. So which approach should we stand? And of course, there's only one way to find out. We need a radio, randomized controlled trial. And uh, of course, that's a diagram for, for, for the radiotherapy timing randomization, radicals RT, where patients, where you're kind of uncertain, and we've defined who we think you should be uncertain about in the protocol. But patients where we think you should be uncertain about the use of post operative radiotherapy, randomized in early radiotherapy and deferred radiotherapy, where radiotherapy is given once PSA starts to rise, and it's a really low threshold. Uh, which the radiotherapy will be given. This is a study that's open <coughs> nationwide. Uh, you know, 91 UK centres are, going, are either set up uh, or, or in the process of getting their approvals at the moment. So recruitment should be fantastic for this. It's also open in 11 Canadian centres. Danish centres will be opening next month. And we're in discussions with a couple of other groups uh, around the world too. And there are a couple of other groups. There's a group in France and a group in New Zealand who are asking overlapping questions as well. 
It's, a, it's approved, it's prioritized as a study. It's an important part of the National Cancer, uh, the NCRI Prostate Clinical Studies Portfolio. It's been peer reviewed, it's been grant funded through C Cancer Research UK, through CTAC, which is highly competitive, and is sponsored by the Medical Research Council. And uh, I'm a statistician on, on this trial. So it's an area of agreed, important clinical uncertainty. And there's a number of editorials calling for a trial like radicals. Yet recruitment is struggling. So, so why is this? You know, what's, what's happening? Why aren't we getting the patient into the radiotherapy timing randomization here? We only have anecdotes, but the anecdote that comes back to us over and over again is it's communication issues at the site. There's conflicting priorities of the clinicians. They either do or they don't want to participate. Sometimes it's the oncologist, sometimes the urologist. They can't agree on which patient should go into which, uh, you know, uh, should go into which part of the trial if they should even approach them. Perhaps you know, some people say, well, practice isn't really being driven by the evidence at the moment. The MDTs aren't identifying enough patients, or, or they're identifying them too late, and it's too late to approach them about the trial. You know, or, by the time patients are approached, they've already been given a very strong steer as to whether they should be expecting early or deferred radiotherapy. So this is a trial that needs broad and enthusiastic support. And you look at the number of centres and you think it should be there, but actually, you know, this is a trial that needs streamlining. We need a very focused approach to get this to work, if we're to answer this important question. So it's something we really need to work on, I think. So I just kind of want to draw that out as, a, as an example of, of, of how trials should, you know, trials which we think matter nationally, matter in science as well, and how we should try and work together to, to improve recruitment. It's a bit of a despondent note, isn't it? So let's just try, try and recap and, and be a bit more up-tempo. Let's recap where we're going. So the randomized controlled trial is a, it's a necessary research tool and hopefully just reiterated to you why it's a cornerstone of evidence-based medicine and why it's a gold standard approach for, for moving treatment, moving <coughs> and improving treatments for our patients. That when sites are approached about clinical trials, these are things that have generally been prioritized nationally. These trials are we, the things that we should all be getting together to work around, to work together. These are you know, priorities set by opinion leaders. And that there are a series of ongoing trials uh, that really need support, both directly from staff involved and indirectly from staff who may sort of butt up against patients who, who may be approached about clinical studies. Anyway, hopefully that's made you into time, and uh, I can let you get to your own network. Side, you see, you made statistics look very interesting there. And I know you've set the seat nicely because this is a collaborative group at the end of the day. And the message is taken away clear and loud and clear that this is something we would all be keen to recruit patients to. I'll bring you back just as a question, if I may, to the radicals trial because you suggested that the MRC had defined what uncertainty was and then it redefined it. Ah, uh, well. <laughs> So it all seems a bit uncertain. I think that didn't help. Uh, well, so this was a, 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 a... I don't know how many of you looked at the eligibility criteria. We effectively tried to take a very loose approach, as has happened in a series of, of other trials in the past. You, it, it, the radiotherapy timing was for, for patients where there was uncertainty about the sort of patients, whether or not they should have radiotherapy. And so we defined in the appendix, or somewhere in the protocol, the sort, the sort of patients that we thought you should be uncertain about. But recruitment was slow. And the anecdotes were saying, well, you, we couldn't get agreement in the MDT about which patients we should be uncertain about. You, whilst they, a certain patient met your criteria for uncertainty, the oncologist felt they should be given radiotherapy, or the urologist felt they shouldn't be given radiotherapy. And perhaps it would streamline it if we were much more explicit about the patients that should be, that, you know, that should be considered for the study. So we tried to make this much more explicit, and it would give the people who wanted to have these discussions much, something much stronger to bang on the table and say, look, these are the sort of patients that should go in. You should be uncertain about these guys. <laughs> so I, I think you're right. It may have given you, we tried to strengthen it that way. <coughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm a great supporter of that trial, <laughs> but I'll tell you where I struggle with it. First of all, it's not the MDT that identifies those patients. Patients who fail primary treatment are seen in clinic, yep. and it's down to the urologists who are seen and will spot them. And then you've got to go to the individual urologist, and each of those will have their own criteria as to who is the patient who might need radiotherapy. And I think when you redefine the uncertainty criteria, you made it looser. Oh, no, no, we lifted well, it beta. Well, allowed all three, any, any, any abnormality, gleason 7, positive marginal, 
And the feeling was, well, I think there are higher risk patients who would benefit from randomising to see if it made a difference. Okay. And I'm worried that by loosening the criteria, which is how they perceived it, the, the message from the study would be diluted and not answer the question that was set out to us. That's an interesting point. Okay. So the, we've got neurologists on the trial management group uh, that they, they, they hadn't felt that, but I, I think that's an important point there, John. Um, perhaps we can get you to come along to one of the trial management group meetings and... and, and that. <laughs> Fifteen old. <laughs> Anyone else got any questions from that? Okay, thank you very much, Matt. I won't keep people too long from uh, their networking.